Tonight, we celebrate Father's Day. And I want to begin by wishing all of you fathers a very blessed and happy Father's Day. Now, I'm just curious, who would the oldest father be in our sanctuary tonight? Mr. Gorday. <laughs> You've been a father many years, yes? Who would the youngest father be tonight? Who just had a, a baby? Hard to know. Who is the father with the most children in our sanctuary tonight? <laughs> Can anybody beat seven? <laughs> Who is the father that most recently gave his daughter away in marriage? The father of the bride. Now I'm going to ask you a real question here. Who is the best father in our midst? God the Father, by far, hands down, God the Father is our very best Father. Friends, I think it's important that we honor fathers because fathers are very, very important to the advance of the kingdom of God. And fathering, there's nothing easy about it. We all, we all as fathers, stand in need of all the help we can get. I want to begin tonight, I've entitled the message, Father Power, because I believe fatherhood is a strong influence, not only on the family, but in the society. Does anybody here know the history of Father's Day, how it came to be? If you're following in your outline, it began small in 1910, it's fairly recent. A woman by the name of Sonora Smart Dodd in Spokane, Washington, wanted to honor her father. And the reason she wanted to honor her dad is because her dad, William Smart, was a single parent who had been widowed, who raised six children by himself. And he thought, if we can honor our mothers, we should probably also honor our fathers. So she approached her pastor the pastor liked the idea, and they decided to honor the dads on that particular Sunday. Later, she tried to promote the idea, and she campaigned that all of the state of Washington and maybe the country, the USA, would also honor their fathers. Surprisingly, it got a lot of resistance, and it just didn't take root. So that was 1910. Still not catching on through the 20s and 30s, even though President Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge tried to establish it nationally. But interestingly enough, the U.S. Congress said no. They blocked it every time. What was their fear? That, would, that it would turn into another commercialistic holiday. Only this time they would be promoting neckties and tobacco pipes and maybe be a good thing for men's clothing stores. So Congress said forget it until 1966, when President Lyndon Baines Johnson represented it, and it became official in the USA. And Richard Nixon in 1972, I'm, I'm thinking about this, I was eight years old when the USA finally decided to have Father's Day. It's kind of surprising. And then 14, when it finally passed into legislation and it became official. Now, since then, those early days, it's become very internationalized. But it's interesting that even though the idea has spread, the date hasn't. In the USA, as well as the UK, and India, and Bahrain, we celebrate every second, or every third Sunday, rather, in June, is Father's Day. But did you know in Russia, they don't celebrate Father's Day until... February. In uh, Estonia, where we served more than 13 years in the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, they celebrate it the second Sunday in November. It's funny, I was talking with my daughter, Patricia, 
last night. And uh, I, I happened to mention, I said, this has been a great conversation, and uh, you've made my Father's Day. Oh, she goes, Dad, I forgot. I thought we celebrated that in November. Because where she grew up, we did celebrate it in November. In any case, doesn't matter which date we celebrate it, I think it's always good when we can honor fathers, put the focus on them, and pray for them. And the reason is, fathers have a very big influence on families and on the society at large. But as far as God is concerned, dads are primarily responsible for passing on the faith from their generation to the next. Mothers are very important as well, but fathers have been commissioned by the Lord to make sure they tell their sons and daughters who they believe in, why they believe, pass the faith on. We see this reflected in Psalm 78, which Edgar read a few minutes ago. It's very interesting that this is a very, very long psalm, and we only read the first seven verses, which are the key to the passage tonight. But if we were to read the rest of the psalm, we would find out that the the psalm becomes pretty negative and pretty critical of Israel. Because in so many generations, they failed to pass on the faith effectively to the next generation. And it led to disaster. But I want to keep it positive tonight. And I want us to look at this beginning, which is what God intended. All my people, verse 1 says, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors, literally things our fathers have told us. Now, if we go back to the Proverbs, we see that right from the very beginning, we get Proverbs like this. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Both mom and dad are very key in passing on our Christian faith to our children. Now, we cannot force faith on anybody, let alone our children. But it is our responsibility to make it attractive, to do everything we can to encourage our children to also believe for themselves. And it's interesting, don't forsake the Father's instruction. This has to do with wisdom, not just knowledge. But wisdom is sort of like applied knowledge, practical knowledge, how life works, how we really relate to God, how we really relate to other people, what we do when we're being challenged. Wisdom is to be passed from parent to to child. That's the point. Now in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, we see an instruction goes forth for the fathers. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, it says in the NIV. How many of you can honestly tell me you understand the word exasperate? That's what I thought. NIV usually does a far better job of Uh, giving us words we can really understand in the common English. Uh, But if you go to the literal, it's literally, do not provoke your children to anger or to frustration. Don't do it. Instead, that's the negative instruction, instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And again, it's addressed specifically to fathers. So we see that fathers have a big responsibility, and we need to be teaching our children about the ways of the Lord. In the Old Testament, we see this brought out in Deuteronomy really well. Deuteronomy 6. The beginning of every Jewish 
service, they always begin with the Shemai, what they call the Shemai, which is the Hear, O Israel, Yahweh the Lord our God, Yahweh is one. And that's how this passage starts. But look at how it continues. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, translating what this means for us today, communicate the truths of the faith in everyday life, in the ordinariness of the things that we do each day, which implies we need to spend time with our children. I mean, there is not a chance we're going to convey anything to them until we spend adequate time with them and we become important in their life. When, it, when the scriptures say things like impress, talk, sit, walk, taking it to the 21st century, when you're in the car, <laughs> when you're doing some house chores together, Maybe when you, dad, might be helping your son or your daughter with homework. Or you're doing a school project together. No matter what you're doing, there are going to be wonderful moments that naturally happen. Those are the best teaching moments. Maybe they had a conflict at school. Maybe they were bullied. And just... A word from dad at that time has a huge impact on their spirituality. Might even be as basic as when you're doing something fun together. Those are the times. Not necessarily when you're having a devotional at the at the end of a meal. Maybe that happens too. But I don't think that's the critical thing here. I think it's in the ordinariness of life. As we spend time with our children, that's when we need to do what we can to convey who the Lord is in our lives to them. The everyday tasks. Which means it's important that we are interested in the things our children are. That we attend their events. It always hurt me a lot when I would hear my father talk about my grandfather. I never knew my grandfather, but he apparently was a stern and hard man. Not with a bad heart spiritually, but with a bad heart physically. His heart was literally three times too large by the time he died. And my dad used to say that he could, when he was listening carefully at a meal, He could hear the pounding of his dad's heart. It was so large. But it made him stern and easily annoyed. And he was a strict disciplinarian. He happened to be a principal. In the days, I think, when in the principal's office, there was a paddle and they used it on students. But it always hurts me to hear him talk about his dad because... Sports was so important to my father, and his dad never bothered to attend any of his events. And then when he was just 12, he died. And my dad didn't miss his dad. I I give that only as a negative example. We have to spend time, we have to be involved in our children's lives if we're going to pass on the faith to them. Unfortunately, my grandmother made up for my grandfather, because my grandmother was so godly and the faith was passed down. Friends, we need to be intentional. Fathers, we need to be intentional about passing on our faith to our children. And at at the lowest level, we need to be friends with our children and spend time with them 
they need to know how important they are to us. As the psalmist says, we must tell the next generation. We will not hide them from their children, verse 4 says. We will tell the next generation. What will they tell the next generation? The praiseworthy deeds of Yahweh the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. I believe that we shouldn't only talk about the great things God has done for us through Jesus, but we can talk about how the Lord has met our personal needs. And we can personalize it with our children. They need to see that it's real. Fathers have an actual uh, legacy to leave behind. In a sense, they will leave a legacy for several generations. This is what the psalmist is saying in verses 5 through 7. God decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so that the next generation will know them, even the children yet to be born. Once again, the concept of inside the loins are the relatives. And they, in turn, will tell their children. Do you see the pattern? You see, the line will be broken unless every generation enthusiastically passes their faith to the next one. We mustn't let let the link be broken. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds and would keep his commands. If people know who the Lord is and what he's done for us, then we'll know the ways of the Lord and the next generation will be blessed. And the generation that comes after our children will be blessed. And it continues. When I think about, I I always like to say this, don't assume, fathers, that simply by sending your children to the church school that the teachers will do your job. Or the pastor will do your job. Believe me, if they don't see a reality in, in, in the lives of their fathers and their mothers, it's not going to matter a whole lot what goes on in church school or what the pastor has to say. Rather, we want to reinforce what's going on in the home. That's a challenge. When I think of a godly heritage, though, and passing of the faith from one generation to the other, a great example of this is Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards is known as a great revivalist. And he was a great preacher, born in 1703, lived until he died in 1758. He had 55 years on the earth. He happened to be the only son of a rather large family He had ten sisters. How would you like that? Talk about a lot of female in that family. Ten sisters, no brothers. He was educated at Yale College, and he graduated valedictorian at age 16. So he loved books, and he was good at them. He was a Puritan at heart, and in his theology, very reformed. He was involved in a great move of God that's come to be known as the Great Awakening that literally, at the time, saved the American colonies before they became a nation. Now, he is known for some amazing preaching that he did in New England in the colonies at that time. But fewer people know about his family life, and that's what I want to talk about because he had a vibrant spirituality, and he conveyed something in the home which helped the faith to be passed generation to generation. Jonathan, taking a hint from his mom and dad, 
married a, a, a woman named Sarah, and they had 11 children, three sons and eight daughters. Coincidentally, the first four children were born on Sundays. Almost like the Lord is sending a message. But as well known as he is for his preaching, this is what really impresses me. The legacy he left behind. If you do the math, when he, by the time he died, 1758, he had 11 children and he had some grandchildren. And now it's 2017, 260 years later. But in that line of 260 years, 300 ministers of the gospel have come from Jonathan and Sarah's line, including several missionaries, and lots of them became theological professors, 120 college professors. But that's not all. 110 lawyers, 30 judges, 60 authors of books, 14 university presidents, and a vice president of the USA, the third one, Aaron Burr. And if you happen to know that, you're, you're, you're going to win in Trivial Pursuit. Oh, also, nearly 60 doctors, medical doctors, from this line. Amazing. So Edward's light is shining brightly, generation to generation, still impacting our world. And the whole time, no matter what way they're serving the public, committed followers of Jesus. And that's the most important thing. How many of you believe in generational blessings? Yeah, I do too. I believe it can go both ways. There's generational blessings, there's generational curses. It's good to be aware of the curses too and break those curses in Jesus' name but to recognize and promote generational blessings so that they pass down our line from one generation to the next. The book of Exodus, verse 30, or chapter 34, verses 6 and 7 says, And God passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands of generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now, I don't know about you, but that's intimidating. You mean my habitual, unrepentant sin can get passed right on down to my children and to their children's children? I think so. The patterns can go from one generation to another. That's why we, we need to acknowledge it, break it, repent of it, renounce it, and pray against it. Let it not pass to the next generation. And rather, our love for God our love for God's Word, our habit of praying about things, these kinds of things, they get passed on generation to generation as well. And we're able to bless multiple generations by how we're living now as fathers and as mothers. So I want to encourage us tonight. Let us use Father power for the Lord, for the passing on of our faith, to pass on a godly heritage. The convicting question for us to examine is what are we passing on to our children? What are you passing on to your children? Hopefully a godly heritage, father power, for the Lord. Now, when I think of father power, I, I go back to, I think of an old commercial that I've always remembered from the early 1970s. Keith, you might remember it. 
Um, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a commercial that is against cigarette smoking. And what they do is they show fishing poles. They show a father and his young son walking to a, a little pond, and they're going to go fishing together. And then they cast their rods, and they start fishing. A little bit later, the father picks up a stone and skips it along the pond. And the son sees what his father is doing. He picks up a stone, and he throws the stone into the pond. And then the father takes out a pack of cigarettes. And the son takes a look at that. And then the point is, like father, like son, think about it before you light up. And of course, it's produced by the American Cancer Society. Once they had absolutely determined the connection between cigarette smoking and cancer. But it's so true, isn't it? Fathers will be emulated, particularly by their sons, but also by daughters. We fathers have a great influence on our children. And we cannot control the choices that they're going to make, but we can influence them. And that's father power. We need to train our children for real life because our children are like transmitters and receivers. They absorb everything we say and even more what we do. We will condition them on how to respond to God in certain ways, on what we do in a crisis. We'll teach them things like work ethic. If they see us working hard, they'll naturally want to emulate and they'll work hard. We'll give them a set of values and habits. I so appreciate the fact that when I was just a, a little boy, I mean, I think five years old, my dad taught me the importance of giving to the Lord. So he gave us an allowance, an, an allowance back in 1963 in the USA for a middle-class boy was 10 cents, a dime. And he would give us he would he would give the ten pennies, and then he'd say, Now the Bible says one of those pennies belongs to the Lord. And he taught me tithing. One penny. It got a little bit more difficult when he started giving me a quarter. Then what do you do? <laughs> then hopefully you give three pennies. But the point is, from a very, very young age, I learned to tithe so that later on, I didn't even give it a second thought. It was just a part of my habit. And while I believe it's an old covenant practice, the new covenant should be at least that. We should give at least what the law of the old covenant demanded. And, and when we give generously to the Lord, It'll ne we'll never go wrong financially. It's the best thing we can do. I'm so grateful that my dad taught me that when I was just five years old. Made an impression. We fathers have the power to bless or to handicap our family line for several generations. So let's invest spiritually into the lives of our children. Let's teach them a love for God's word by reading when they're young. Read the Bible to them, but most importantly, obeying it, showing them that we take it seriously. By showing them that we have a respect for God-ordained authority, and by showing them that God's people are to be appreciated and the church is important. If we have a positive view of a congregation, our children will probably pick that up, and vice versa. Now, friends, Father Power is strong, but we need God's help. There are so many challenges that our children are facing today that I don't believe we faced when we were young. A lot of ungodly influences. Yes, they've always been there, but I think there's an onslaught with the internet and TV. All the more. Fathers, we need to be influencing our children and you know what? doesn't matter how old we are. 
we can still influence our children even as adults. And they'll come to us for counsel. How will we respond? Will we make time for them? Will we give them the kind of advice they need that will encourage them to keep going in the faith that we want to pass down to them? In just a moment, I'm going to pray, but in a moment I'm going to ask if Pastor Keith would come and offer a prayer specifically for all of us fathers in the sanctuary. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that most of us here can say that we've come into a relationship with you perhaps because of our fathers and mothers and the way they passed on the faith to us. Lord, we're also grateful that there are cases where our fathers and maybe our mothers did not even know the Lord. The Lord, in your mercy, you reached down to us and you have brought us into faith. And Lord, we pray that whether we're fathers now or whether we'll be fathers in the future, that we would commit to passing on our faith to our children and that we would disciple our own children and that we'll spend time with them and enjoy them and enter into their lives and be there for our sons and daughters in those critical times. And Lord, for those of us who maybe have fathered for a long time, help us to look around and realize that there are young people around us that don't have their fathers necessarily nearby. Maybe we can be a father to somebody who needs a father. Help us, Father, to be like you, our Abba Heavenly Father, who loves us so much that he sent Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord and to save us from our sins. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.